Bienvenido a todos. It is Monday, June 14th, but that doesn't really matter because it's a podcast. Uh, we're just happy that you are listening to us or watching us on our YouTube channel whenever, wherever you are. Uh, we have a, a pretty uh, interesting topic. Uh, I've been trying to cover it for a long time. We're going to be talking about uh, Palestinian, Puerto Rican solidarity, settler colonialism, and a bunch of other things related to what it means to stand in solidarity with liberation movements. We welcome Sarah Awatani. She is a social movement historian and Latinx studies scholar and currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. Sarah, welcome to the Paseo Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I'm doing great, and I'm truly honored to be here. I like would have never imagined eight years ago applying to grad school that I would be speaking with y'all in the community. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What should our audience know about you? I'm currently at Harvard University on a postdoctoral fellowship, and my research and teaching is really focused on Latinx and Arab American radicalism. It's thinking about interracial solidarities, but also policing and American global power. Um, and, you know, what's probably most exciting is that the book manuscript that I'm working on right now um, is exploring a globally expansive history of Palestine liberation informing Puerto Rican radicalism and how the United States tried to weaponize those freedom dreams. What part of Puerto Rico is your family from? What part of uh, Palestine is your, is your family from? Yeah, so my mom grew up in Rio Piedras uh, before she moved to Florida to finish her college degree. Um, but my grandfather's side of the family is from San Sebastian, and my grandmother is from um, Naguabo. And when I was growing up, she actually lived in a up in the mountains in Ceiba, so that's where I frequented when I was visiting as a child. Um, and my dad's side of the family is Palestinian. They migrated from um, Awarta, which is a small village, to um, Amman, Jordan. So my family is in Jordan now, but that's where that's where we're from. The, the question I normally ask our guests what part of Puerto Rico they're from is always like interesting to hear where people are, are rooted, where they can trace their ancestry to. Um, so hearing about the Palestinian side, uh, it's especially significant. So we really want to focus on settler colonialism. You know, what, is, what has solidarity looked like between the Puerto Rican community and the Palestinian community? Um, so just to kind of give us a, a, a good base here, how would you describe settler colonialism? Yeah, great question. So settler colonialism is really a form of colonialism that's predicated on this idea of eliminating the native, right? Um, and, and replacing it with a settler population. Um, so that's what we mean when we say that United States is a settler colony, right? The forced removal of indigenous populations, the forced con containment of indigenous populations. Um, and that's also what we mean when we say, when folks talk about ethnic cleansing in relationship to settler colonialism. Um, but the refrain that I think is really important in understanding settler colonialism is that it's a structure, not an event, right? So I'll repeat that. It's a structure, not an event. In other words, it's not singular and it's not contained to the past. Um, and that's why something like a land recognition is important, right? They often feel performative, but what it's really asking folks to recognize and to acknowledge is that dispossession is ongoing, right? It's the way in which power has been built and maintained. I appreciate that context. And yeah, I think at the center of this, a lot of this is, is power, right? Who, who has power over who? And a lot of times who has power, not just over property, but over people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's incredibly heartbreaking, the stories that you hear, especially um, as it relates to that part of the world, that region. You'll see the extreme violence that's been happening um, between the Israeli government and Palestinians. Um, again, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of, of that per se. Um, but it's something that we should all be abreast to because uh, it's a significant issue uh, and it holds a ripple effect for international relationships, uh, especially how we question what authority international bodies have over land. Um, so when it comes to something like settler colonialism, would love to, to, to hear your thoughts on, on how exactly something like settler colonialism relates to the status of Puerto Rico as well as Palestine today. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with Palestine because I think that that mm -hmm. is a classic, classic example, right? Um, so when you think of Palestine, you often hear people talk about the Nakba. And you hear now, especially in the past few weeks, you know, the phrase that there's an ongoing Nakba. 
Um, so here, the Nakba references both a specific moment in time, so 1948, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced from their homes and they were made refugees as a result of the founding of Israel, right? But we should also think of it as a continuous process, right? Again, that idea of settler colonialism as a structure, not just an event. Um, so it's the continuous process of, process of the removal of native Palestinians with the intent of replacing them with Jewish, um, Jewish Zionist settlers. Um, and so that's why there's so much pushback in the last few weeks, specifically um, of the Israeli government and honestly, even like US media's framing of the um, forced removals of Palestinians in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood as a real estate dispute, right? Mm. It's not a real estate dispute. It's not folks who can't you know, pay their rent. It's about settler colonial power and about removing populations. Um, and as other people had, have said, I think it's a really, I think it's a moment for us to think about how our terminology is really important, right? I think a refrain that's been coming out in the past few weeks is this idea that the relationship between Palestine and Israel is not a, conf is not a conflict, it's an occupation, right? It's apartheid and it's not evictions it's ethnic cleansing. Um, so again, the terms we use matter because they help us name um, and describe different structures of power. Um, and then just a final kind of reminder in terms of settler colonialism in Palestine is that the United States was the first country to recognize Israel as a state. And we also send, send um, massive amounts of military assistance to Israel, right? So the two countries are also collaborating on joint military exercises, um, on policing, on counterterrorism, and on weapons development. So that's what we mean when folks are critiquing that these are two settler colonies that are really intertwined with one another. I think what's important for understanding kind of Israel's founding is to, to take a few steps back from the framing in which we, many of us have kind of come to understand Israel as our democratic partner in the Middle East, as you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as this centuries-long religious conflict, and to remember that it's a it's a settler colonial project, right? The Zionist movement emerges out of Europe, and is about finding a homeland um, for for you know the U European Jew Jewish people in Europe. I don't know the right way to say that. It's about finding a homeland, like is a legitimate concern, but is embedded in kind of white supremacist ideals of colonization, of domination. Um, so as much as it is a reaction to kind of the very real anti-Semitic violence that we see in Europe, um, it is also reproducing certain structures of violence. The UN was essentially mm. the, the main body that said, see this land right here, this land is now going to be known as mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of the fact that it, it already had a name, it already mm -hmm. had people living mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of that's where I was mm. where I was kind of okay. going with that. Um, yeah. But but that's okay. I mean, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to like, if you want to approach the the response to that lens, you can. Yeah. Um, so if, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. There's just so many moving parts, right? So mm -hmm. in part, it's about you know. <laughs> trying, trying to think Britain right giving a mandate to Palestine like Britain has control over the region of Palestine it is promised both to the Palestinians and to the Jewish people and it becomes this kind of conflict um, that really is centered around the United Nations and the United Nations eventually um, stepping in with you know the support of a superpower like the United States and authorizing that land um, to this new um, state of Israel. Yeah, so it's kind of like, um, like uh, to use like uh, use an example here in the states. What happens if the UN all of a sudden decided to say, hey, you know, this plot of land here, the United States, this is now going to be known as X name, whatever, and we're going to make sure that we're giving we're giving this land back to the indigenous population. Mm -hmm. 
which would be a sight to see. I mean, that would be fascinating. <laughs> um, but for people in the States that may think this is a black and white issue, mm -hmm. I mean, really think about the context. I mean, it, you, to have an external body say, you're no longer, you're no, the people, to the people living in an area, this isn't, we're going to call it this. And now this belongs to, you know, X group of people. That's, that's pretty ballsy. That's, that's, uh, that, that is a uh, stepping over a line. If mm -hmm. it feels, um, and I mean, you can, to my earlier question about settler colonialism and how that relates to Puerto Rico, you could look back to something like 1898, where the America said, we now have this land um, and we saved it from the Spanish. It was going to be a Spanish land. Now we can save it. It's going to be Puerto Ricans. We're going to welcome them into the United States. When Spain was already uh, allowing Puerto Rico its own path to independence. Um, so just this whitewashing uh, of history to make things seem very like black and white is um, is just important context. Um, Absolutely. Uh, how would you like, how would you describe what settler colonialism looks like today, though, in, in Puerto? I know we just talked about Palestine, but, you know, how would you say settler colonialism uh, relates to the status of Puerto Rico today? Yeah, so Puerto Rico and thinking about settler colonialism is really interesting because it's not often used to describe mm -hmm. the island's relationship to the United States, right? And and in some ways that makes sense, right? If we're thinking historically, I know you asked about kind of our contemporary moment, but again, if we're thinking mm -hmm. historically, it's true that in taking possession of the archipelago, like the United States was not really invested in importing a settler population, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it also doesn't really make settler colonialism irrelevant. Um, the United States is a settler colonial nation, right? So those ideologies are going to inform its domestic and foreign policies, regardless of whether that's the intention in bringing, you know, in colonizing a specific land. That's still kind of the structural, you know, the structural ideological formations. Um, so to me, it always seemed irresponsible to act as if those logics haven't informed the United States' dominion over Puerto Rico. At the same time, we do see activists now, both in Puerto Rico and in the diaspora, who are way more readily naming settler colonialism um, in Puerto Rico as something to be aware of, to organize around, et cetera. Um, so we see this especially post Hurricane, um, Hurricane Maria with disaster capitalism, right? With these land grabs, with tax incentives that are meant to lure in the rich. Um, and even with those kind of terrible Bitco Bitcoin bros that if you've seen, for example, the landfall documentary where we did a, did a similar event thinking about um, settler colonialism in Puerto Rico and Palestine and in, and in Hawaii, we were really struck by kind of the audacity of some of the folks moving onto the island as if it is their own, right? Um, and again, but to think historically again, in the 1980s, there were also a group of Puerto Rican activists who were really kind of obsessed with this idea of Plan 2020, which was this proposed um, kind of modernization scheme that was meant to transform or allegedly meant to transform the island um, into a massive industrial complex, which would have made it in uninhabitable, right? So even, even prior, like prior generations of activists were trying to kind of name settler colonialism in their own organizing. Now, I'm glad you said that. And I think a, a really good example is, um, you know, the U.S. military's presence in the in Vieques. I mean, exactly. Military mm -hmm. tests, bombs, um, you have the health effects that come from that. Still mm -hmm. have act, you know, uh, abandoned materials, um, still trying to dig out old mines from, from that from that land. When you look at how uh, land is distributed, who benefits, who's given uh, the incentive to, mm -hmm. to take over land. And it's all done legally. I watched the Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul fight and Logan Paul uh, had Dorado, Puerto Rico as where mm -hmm. he was from. Oh my gosh, I was fuming. I was like, Floyd, you better knock this guy out. Uh -huh. Come on. Uh, he didn't. <laughs> just big let down but uh that just burned in my head because it was it represented it was more than just a youtuber you know mm -hmm. saying moving mm -hmm. to puerto rico it represented how the legislative process how policy can really work for the wealthy and mm -hmm. uh, uh the extremely wealthy and then put to the side uh the extremely poor
Absolutely. Um, and those tax incentives are like also not new, right? There have been right. different kind of industries that have been lured to the island mm -hmm. since the U.S. took over. And those are, you know, to me, that is similar to a settler colonial paradigm, right? Like that is a, yeah. a, a similar interest. Yeah, no, definitely. And there's uh, there's, a, there's something we're going to talk about this more next week, but there's something called Act 60, which mm -hmm. for, that allows for businesses and individuals to pay zero to nothing mm -hmm. in taxes, which is ridiculous. And people in Puerto Rico can't even benefit from that. So looking mm -hmm. at something like Hurricane Maria, the United States had the funding to assist it, uh, assist the island in its recovery, decided not to do that. So what happens to all that land that has blue tarps over it, that mm -hmm. is destroyed, that really needs that aid for people to mm -hmm. rebuild their homes? Okay, well, they leave, mass exodus from the island. Who gets to snatch up all that property? Everybody mm -hmm. that gets a tax incentive to move to the island. Next thing you mm -hmm. know, the majority of people living on the island in the next few years or few decades could not be Puerto Rican. It could be mm -hmm. whoever from the United Absolutely. States. Absolutely, um, yeah. And all done legally, which is... Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, folks draw on, you know, the example of Hawaii and statehood mm -hmm. to say, you know, is statehood just a settler colonial project? And who is that really benefiting? And who is going to, you know, who is going to drive that development? And is it going back to the native population, right? Mm -hmm. Or are they just going to be displaced? Yeah. For years, I've been to Puerto Rican festivals, uh, parades, and I kid you not, like every year, I will see a Palestinian flag, uh, or fl Palestinian flags, I should say, in a sea mm -hmm. of Puerto Rican flags. And I remember thinking when I was younger, is that like a municipality's flag in Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. What is that flag? Um, and then you know, college came along. I, I I started to understand, you know, what the significance was there. And I always found it fascinating that you're, for the most part, at least here in Chicago, you're always going to see a Palestinian flag if it's a, a Puerto Rican celebration, like without, mm -hmm. without failure. It's, the, the presence is there and it's seen and it's known. Um, so would love to hear from you if you have like two to three examples from the past of how the Puerto Rican community has stood in solidarity with Palestinians and, and vice versa, too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I have so many examples, as this is my book manuscript. Yeah. And I, I, I had a chance to read some of your writing, and I was just blown away. I thought it was fantastic, which is why I came up with this question. I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't yeah, wait. Yeah, so my answers might sound familiar to you or yeah. to anybody who has kind of read my work, and I've done a few talks in the community, so that wouldn't be surprising. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that you bring up the question of, like, flags at shared demonstrations or even not shared demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So one of my first articles that I, you know, published is was trying to make sense of images I saw posted on social media in 2014 after Israel's offensive on Gaza, then known as um, Operation Protective Edge. So there were really massive demonstrations in Chicago, and I saw posted, I think it was from La Respuesta, which was a publication that was out of the community in Chicago. Um, so they were posting these images of folks at the protests and among them, among them, you know, I think in the article I talk about um, that there are Puerto Rican flags at this protest that say freedom for Oscar Lopez Rivera, right? But there's also an image that is really striking to me of Eddie Cortez, former political prisoner, um, who is wearing a shirt with Oscar Lopez's face on it. And I was like, why is this significant? Like, this is a choice that somebody has made. And like, what is the history behind it, right? And um, so that really drove the um, dissertation project, now book manuscript, to really think about how Puerto Rican radicals, how the armed kind of wing of the Puerto Rican independence movement, I look specifically at the FALN, so the Armed Forces of National Liberation, imagined Puerto Rican decolonization alongside um, Palestinian liberation and Israeli settler colonial violence, right? I mean, so what that moment allowed for me to do was ask longer historical questions where you really see a small faction of Puerto Ricans trying to imagine themselves as part of a global struggle against imperialism where Palestinians are their comrades in struggle, right? They're trying to think about what is the utility of armed struggle they're trying to think about what is, you know, how do we define ourselves as freedom fighters and not terrorists? So solidarity in that instance is really about these kind of global visions of liberation. But there's also a really cool story to, you know, 
Puerto Rican Palestinian Solidarities in Chicago. So the book manuscript actually begins with a protest at University of Illinois at Chicago Circle in 1978. So what's happening there is that there is an Israeli Independence Day celebration that occurs every year on campus and Puerto Rican and Palestinian students, among other student groups, organize a counter demonstration essentially. And it really becomes a story of solidarity where the university administration is really trying to prosecute students and um, these Puerto Ricans and Palestinians. And again, we see kind of black activists. We see some of the Mexican American activists at UAC um, organizing under organizing in response to experiences of surveillance and repression, right? So their solidarity is about not just kind of these larger self-determination struggles, but about very specific experiences of policing, of political repression in the 1970s in Chicago. So remember, this is a period in which, you know, the Puerto Rican community is under heavy surveillance because of the FALN's activities and also just because of kind of racist policing strategies, right? And similarly, the Palestinian community in Chicago is also under intense surveillance because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, and a lot of similarities there too. I mean, we recently, they dropped a bunch of records that showed just how uh, significant the surveillance was on Puerto Rican independence, uh, independence. Absolutely, tests. exactly. Um, and even on a, on a smaller scale, you know, we're talking about flags. I, I, I forget where I had seen this, but it was a conversation over colors and specifically the mm. colors of the Palestinian flag. Mm -hmm. um, and, and immediately I started thinking, oh my gosh, this reminds me of the gag law for Puerto Ricans. But it was something, it was like 1980 90 to 1993, I think it was, or, or yeah, maybe 92. It was like a 12 or 13 year span where the Israeli government actually prohibited Palestinian artists from using the colors of the Palestinian flag in their work. Again, smaller scale, but it's, it speaks to this overall, like not only eradicate the, the land someone's on, but also attack the culture, attack mm -hmm. the imagery, attack, attack anything that we could be that could be perceived as a threat to our own power. Um, and the reason I mentioned the gag laws because it was illegal to use our flag. So I just those are just again small thing, but I just started to the, the, the similarities just started to click for me right now. You know, this conversation I feel on Twitter is great. You know I think you get people on different ends of the spectrum as it relates to. Palestine status, mm -hmm. Puerto Rico status, um, and sometimes it can be a little bit of a tire fire uh, mm -hmm. on Twitter. But a lot of times, I mean, for me at least, I've been lucky. Uh, it's proven to be a very informative discussion. Now, when I watch mainstream news, it's a different story. I, I, I can see a clear bias in the way things are reported, um, and that that's just in my opinion. You know, or what do you feel? Uh, is left out of the mainstream media conversation about um, both Puerto Rican and Palestinian independence? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And I'm going to kind of answer it as the historian scholar, right? To say that I think that the public perception around both the Palestine problems and like using them in quotes deliberately and Puerto Rico's status question are that they're framed as these unique unsolvable problems, right? They're seen as exceptional. Um, and really what my research is trying to do is take seriously moments in which prior generations of activists tried to write against that history, right? Like to claim that, you know, to claim that Puerto Rico is a colonized nation and that Puerto Ricans have the right to take up armed struggle is to claim that Puerto Ricans were part of this kind of third world decolonization movement that was taking the globe by storm in the 1960s and 1970s, right? And so that is purposely writing against this narrative that is that the United States uses to frame Puerto Rico as, you know, not quite foreign, not quite domestic. How do we exactly solve this problem? We're just going to keep it as our commonwealth because we don't know what to do with it, allegedly. Um, so again, really trying to think through opportunities, as you pointed out, that people are doing on Twitter as well, to think about these global networks of power that animate, you know, the ways in which solidarity activists or Puerto Rican activists or what have you have made connections between different sites that seem disparate, they seem unrelated, but could be understood 
as part of a singular system of power or as part of similar systems of power, right? I want to pause here and say that there are historians and there are scholars who are going to say that comparing Puerto Rico and Palestine or, you know, understanding Puerto Rico through a settler colonial lens, whether through the kind of comparison that you've given us or others is disingenuous at best and irresponsible history and politics at worst. And so to them, I just wanna say that I think taking seriously the comparisons that activists make is really, really good history, right? It's good activism. Like places don't need to be exactly comparable for a comparison to do important political work. So for me, the question is always what do comparisons or what do solidarities ask us to think about how people are understanding Again, structures of power, relationships to power, um, and why would we ever foreclose those conversations, right? To me, that that's part of our freedom dreaming. So you mentioned armed armed struggle, armed conflict. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would you say to somebody that looks at the Puerto Rican struggle for independence, the Palestinian struggle for independence, and says, you know, I can see where they're coming from, but um, I I. I I just can't help but criticize them for embracing armed struggle. Like I, I can't reconcile that. And you know, what would you, what would your response be to someone that criticizes uh, those independence those independent movements that way? Yeah. So I have a lot of thoughts about this question because it's one that comes up often for me. Mm -hmm. um, folks are very uncomfortable about a scholar writing about the armed faction of the Puerto Rican independence movement and then its solidarities with Palestine. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's it's hard to move beyond narratives of terrorism. Um, so it's also funny because this conversation has come up in awkward situations, like on dates where I'm oh, talking geez. about, <laughs> where like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how honored I was to say, for example, meet Oscar Lopez or to interview Eddie Cortez, right? Mm -hmm. And to have people respond like, those are bad people. And I'm like, when this question comes up, it's easiest for me to address it again as a historian, right? So what if we take seriously political actors and their claims? And how do we understand like the historical moment that they're living in? So I'm really animated by this question of like, why, why were you know, Puerto Rican activists, Palestinian activists so compelled that they were willing to kind of risk their lives by taking up armed struggle, right? And that doesn't mean that you have to personally agree with their tactics, um, but it is kind of about honoring the humanity. Like these aren't um, irrational decisions, that there, there is some sort of rationale there, whether we kind of agree with it fundamentally or not, but it tells us something about kind of political worlds. Um, and it's also something that I've been thinking about lately in, in my own writing. The final chapter of my book manuscript is thinking about the final decade in the campaign to free the Puerto Rican political prisoners. So I'm, I'm looking about thinking of um, the 1990s, the organizing around the incarcerated FALN prisoners. So in this final decade, the goal was to kind of capture um, broader, more moderate support, you know, uh, capture support from a broader audience um, to secure the prisoners' freedom. And so the campaign shifted away from kind of this revolutionary internationalist language, as I mentioned before, of kind of third world decolonization, armed struggle, et cetera, to more of a language of human rights and patriotic obligations. So in other words, the, the kind of slogan for the movement became, instead of being freedom fighters, not terrorists, which is what it was in the 1980s, again, very much invested in kind of this um, national liberation jargon, as some of the um, sources will dismiss it. In the 1990s, that language becomes patriots, not terrorists, right? So why I draw on that is that that change in language had really important implications for um, the way the Puerto Rican movement was able to express its solidarity with Palestine. So what I mean by, what I mean by that is the goal of the slogan was to counter accusations of terrorism, right? That's how the United States government was framing them. That's how policing, that's how the media was framing the prisoners, right? And the goal is to assert that they are not, that they are legitimate political actors and that they deserve their freedom. So again, the campaign moved from then 
you know, claiming solidarity with Palestinians to assert that these um, that the that the political prisoners deserve their freedom, right? That they are legitimate political actors. To instead um, looking to Israeli nationalist heroes and also looking to comparisons with American colonists to say this is a legitimate um, anti-colonial movement. So if before the language was freedom fighters, not terrorists, now the language was patriots, not terrorists. So the point is that rather than articulating solidarity with Palestine to counter accusations of terrorism, the campaign instead validated the necessity, the validity of armed struggle through comparisons with Israeli nationalist heroes or even just thinking about American colonists. Um, and so I bring this up to say that by comparing the Puerto Rican political prisoners with Israeli nationalists, with American colonists, is effectively kind of rendering settler colonialism as a legitimate anti-colonial movement, right? And that is so different than the organizing that was happening in the 1980s, which saw solidarity with Palestine, which saw solidarity with Algeria, which saw solidarity with South Africa, right? Is a very different kind of genealogy of resistance that's being drawn on. Um, and so, the um, prisoners are, they gained their freedom in 1999. Yes, and like, thank God that they did. Um, but Puerto Rico is still a colony and many people don't know Puerto Rico is still a colony. Um, and so we're still having conversations like we're having right now, right? That you just asked, like, what do we do when people ask us that the prisoners were terrorists or that the, you know, that they don't agree with armed struggle? Um, and our communities are still really heavily policed and surveilled. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, it, it matters the language we draw on to get free, right? We were, you know, the campaign to free the political prisoners was literally a campaign for freedom. But there were moments in which, you know, that campaign had to rely on appealing to a more moderate or more liberal audience. And in doing so was really kind of abandoning in certain moments, not to say that the prisoners themselves or the solidarity activists themselves kind of refused um, like a revolutionary anti-colonialism or a really progressive politics. It's a warning to, to be careful in, you know, trying to justify the use of armed struggle by drawing comparisons to colonizing powers themselves, right? Like that's not the comparison we want to make. It's easy because we can see the colonizing power as legitimate because they're the ones in control, but it's also abandoning kind of the politics that really animated movements, which is about this bottom up um, solidarity among colonized peoples. To kind of wrap up our discussion, I'm, I'm curious for, for anyone listening that maybe wants to take the time to educate themselves on the Puerto Rican independence movement, Palestinian mm -hmm. independence movement. Um, is there, do you have any good recommendations on where someone could start? So I think maybe one of the first books that I read as an undergraduate student thinking about, you know, you know again, the first time I'd ever really learned Puerto Rican history, um, I remember my professor, she was teaching on the history of Cuba and Puerto Rico. He must have assigned excerpts from the Puerto Rican movement, Voices from the Diaspora, which is an mm -hmm. anthology, it's an edited collection. Um, and there are, you know, oral histories with different activists from the diaspora. There are essays by, for example, Jan Sussler, who's one of the attorneys for the former political prisoners. Um, there are essays on, you know, the history of the occupation of Vieques. Like it's a wonderful kind of um, introductory text to that. And then I would also say Joanna Fernandez has a new, wonderful, fantastic book on the young wards. It's excellent, right? And thinking, in a similar moment as to the folks that I'm writing about, about like this internationalist, you know, calls for Puerto Rican independence that are drawing on this third world internationalist solidarity and really thinking about Puerto Rico as part of this global movement against anti-imperialism. Um, so I think that those would be my two kind of touchstones for the Puerto Rican movement. I have not read Voices from the Diaspora. I am mm. currently, in the midst of reading the Young Lords book, though, from Joanna, uh, my gosh, uh, it's fantastic. And like, it's so good. I've met Cha Cha before. Uh -huh. So, uh, like, being able to read this and like being like when you meet somebody and then you get to read about them in a book. Oh, absolutely. At, that's, 
that's like that book hits it out of the stratosphere when it mm-hmm. comes to covering the young wards. Um, so it's it's I can't recommend it enough. Um, I appreciate you saying Voices from the Diaspora. Definitely adding that to my list uh, of books to to grab. For everybody listening, thank you for for sticking with us. We're here with Sarah Awarthani. She is a social movement historian and Latinx studies scholar and currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. Um, We covered a a pretty heavy topic on today's episode. So I always find these moments really interesting when you transition from a very dense, heavy topic to like, hey, where do you like to eat food? But um, (laughs) that's what commercials exist for. Uh, So um, would love to would love to just kind of get your preferences of a good spot to eat Puerto Rican food and shoot. I mean, even a great spot to eat Palestinian food in your neck of the woods. I know you're in Cambridge right now, um, so you don't have to speak specifically. I don't know what the Puerto Rican (laughs) or Palestinian population looks like like there but um anywhere that you've been in the world yeah. um, what's been your favorite spot to eat puerto rican food what's been your favorite spot to eat palestinian food yeah so if i can't choose my grandparents or aunts or <laughs> uncles as my options i'm gonna throw it back to summer 2018 when i was living in chicago doing okay. research and working on the archive project there and say nelly's like there are a lot of good memories of nelly's again like just truly a wonderful summer, wonderful food, and just a moment in which I felt so embedded and like beloved by the community, like really welcomed, which is, you know, saying something given that I am born and raised in the South, who knew I would end up like working with the Puerto Rican community in Chicago. Um, For Palestinian food, that's a little harder, but I think that I would say there's this wonderful restaurant in DC called Mama Aisha's. And that's also a special memory because in 2016, I finished my master's degree and my one of my uncles um, flew over for the first time and he was here for my graduation. So I, you know, the context is that I am unfortunately a Zoom graduation. So I... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Def- I, I, me too. When I got my master's, it was all done through Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. I def- yeah. I almost oh a year God. ago, I, I defended on June 18th, 2020. So oh my gosh. we have yet to celebrate in person. So that master's degree celebration is especially special to me. And the food at Mama Aisha's is great. And I hope it survived the pandemic because I have no, tr- no yeah. clue. No, for sure. Inshallah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> Okay, what is something you are obsessed with today? Now, it can be related to Puerto Rican, Palestinian. It doesn't have to be related to Puerto Rican or Palestinian culture. Um, you know, what, what, what are you into right now? What are you obsessed with? I will say that this is, um, what is the phrasing? Like you're throwing, plot. this is a major plot twist. Nobody is going to expect this unless you know me. And it is that I am a through and through sports bro. I love the Florida Gators. Okay. Um <laughs> I was born and raised in um, born and raised in Gainesville, Florida. So I have a deep obsession with college football, college baseball, college basketball. I have even left academic conferences to watch football games. I get lots of snarky texts when I do that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the no. passive aggressive. You just feel the passive aggression through the screen. Exactly. <laughs> But, you know, like more seriously, I, I do love to kind of share that because it, it tells a lot about like where I grew up. I grew up very assimilated in Gainesville, Florida. And, you know, there are lots of traumas associated with that. You know, I don't have native fluency in Spanish or Arabic. There's obviously lots of privileges that come along with it. Um, but I think that, you know, that particular upbringing allowed me to ask questions in particular ways and probably is why I'm doing this kind of comparative study now. It was kind of a way to um, affirm my historical identities without having access to kind of familial knowledge that's, you know, that is barred from us if we don't know the languages. I relate to that on so many levels, Sarah. Of course, you know I'm not at, I'm not at your level academically, um, or, or the stuff you've written. Um, but I, I do relate to that on, on a significant level because growing up in Humble Park, significant Puerto Rican population. Um, you know, my knowledge of history was thanks to you know talking about it around the dinner table. Uh, maybe there was some events we were able to go to as a family on Paseo mm-hmm. Boricua, um, but I I felt most connected when I ha- got to have those conversations with the um, you know the historians in our community. So when mm-hmm. we decided to do this podcast, 
you know, for me, it was like, this is, I think this is why I started doing it. Like just to get, just to like educate myself, meet awesome Boricuas that are, are doing interesting things throughout the diaspora on the island. Um, I, I, so anyway, I, I say all that just because I, I get it. I, I totally get it. Um, and I speak Spanglish. You know, I wish I could speak Spanish fluently. Oh, yes. You know, and that's one <laughs> of the things where it just kind of gnaws at you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, one way or another, wherever we were, it brought us here to this conversation today. Um, so very grateful for that. Um, for anybody listening that wants to keep up with you, though, after our conversation has ended, you know, how can people stay up to date? Do you have a website, social media? Um, you know, how can people pick up some of the stuff you've written? Like, how can people keep up with you? Yeah, I am, you know, doing my best to stay off social media as an academic. It's kind of a minefield. But I do have a website. You can just find me at sarahawertani.com. I have a list of kind of all my publications. And if for whatever reason folks can't access it because of the paywall, you can just shoot me an email. There's like a link that'll email directly to me and I'm happy to share my writings. Okay, everybody, that's the special promo code. Now you heard it. (laughs) Um, Okay, Sarah Arwatani, social movement historian, Latinx study scholar, current postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. Appreciate having you on the podcast today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much.